He's a future support leader, founder, entrepreneur, and award winning academic. And he'll be speaking today about the evolution of the internet. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Round of applause. Pleasure. Thanks. I appreciate it. And, and it's a wonder, a wonderful uh, to be here. Um, I want to. One of the main reasons I'm so excited that we have more events uh, on the West Coast. So we have a blockchain in Australia, and when you see all the great events seem to be Sydney, maybe Melbourne, um, and a slowly growing a, a very vibrant community. And uh, having such great speakers before me, like Jolie, uh, Anya, Kevin, and Brandon, and also a few, I think four more excellent speakers after that, it's just a pleasure to see that this uh, vibrant ecosystem is growing. So. Um, Great, we have a strong uh, Web3 community. I call it Web3 now because you know, there's a new buzzwords, aren't they? <laughs> First it was all about Bitcoin, there was blockchain, now it's Web3. Now all the same experts are experts in AI, have you, have you noticed? Yeah. AI, yeah. I wonder what's gonna be next. Uh, so but I would like to look at the, uh, at the Web3 ecosystem and the three projects. Um, do you think it's a good idea to start a project in the crypto winter? Yeah. It's a great, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, you have so much wind in your face. Um, and everybody, and everybody doubts. And I started three of these projects, uh, including one of the units at, uh, at the EWA. And everybody was a big hater. And I, I took so much poop uh, from of my, of my many of my colleagues and management. Don't do it. It's 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 a scam. Blockchain is a scam. Crypto is a scam. These are comments from uh, people at UWA. I cannot obviously name names uh, who were telling me those things in uh, 2017 when I was planning to start uh, Western Australia's first blockchain unit, master level blockchain unit. Um, and we started with the five students in 2018. Uh, four years later, we had 150 students in this class. An average unit, master level unit, has 30 students. Um, so we did quite well. Uh, and I would like to tell you a little bit more about the, the three projects that, uh, that, that we do. And uh, notice that a lot of uh, focus was here on education. And there's a quite big range of how we can think about education. Uh, I will, we'll be talking a little bit from a kind of nerdy point of view. Uh, UWA, we don't have much choice. Uh, we need to be critical. And, and that's not always nice um, for everyone. But I've learned lessons from that, and I would like to share that with you. So, uh, but first I would like to clarify uh, something that is always, uh, well, not always, but often uh, uh, confused, the Web3 and Web3.0. And I've, I, I've heard these terms uh, quite often interchanged. Uh, my particular take, and that's what we teach at, uh, in my unit, uh, we try to make that clear, the distinction clear. Um, Web3, uh, or Web1.0, Web2.0, web you, you're familiar probably with these concepts, right? Web1.0 is usually considered the, the first web, which is uh, kind of um, show only and there's not much interaction. The second, it's uh, read and write. And the third one is so called semantic web. You can perhaps uh, throw ChatGPT into that box. Um, and most of that comes from uh, team uh, Brandon Lee, uh, the founder of, of Web3. Web um, and he is very protective of these concepts, especially Web3.0. Web3, uh, we try to look at Web3 quite differently from the point of view of ownership. And here you can consider the first web as the beginning of the internet, state-sponsored from the uh, US Defense Ministry in the 1970s, or late, late 60s. Um, and then the expansion to engage a private sector in building um, Web2. And that's what we, uh, most of us use uh, on an everyday basis. What these two things have in common is centralization. So Web3 is, uh, uh, what it offers is the, the decentralized web uh, in terms of uh, ownership. Now, who thinks that Web3 or decentralization is uh, a concept that involves a gradual uh, or a scale? Or is it an, an absolute? What do you think? I don't have the perfect answer. I'm just usually, usually trying to check what, what people think. Excuse me? Uh, when, when you look at decentralization, is, a, is it a matter of uh, degree or is it an absolute? A matter of degree? Yeah, it's Well, it's an absolute. That's, a, that's an interesting concept. I, I don't have a perfect answer, but you know, uh, some people think, and I, I suggested that a couple of times, can you be a little bit pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's not a best. Uh, 
um, uh, a comparison. But it gives you an idea that decentralization is not just, okay, I have two nodes, uh, well, I'm decentralized. Um, and of course, we can compare some of the projects that are more and better decentralized, and it's a journey, and it takes, takes a while. But we look at decentralizing quite critically at the university because we have to do it. Uh, and uh, in our reviews, uh, either in research or in, or in teaching, um, uh, we're quite brutal, and that's not necessarily very nice. <clears throat> you trash a lot of projects. And uh, what I realized over a few years, you're actually not helping the ecosystem if you're so critical. Uh, so we tried to open up a little bit and exceed the uh, academia and started a couple of other projects that are more open-minded uh, than the academic rigor. We still apply academic rigor, but we try to uh, be much more inclusive in how we think about Web3. Um, so the uh, unit that I talked about that I started in 2018 is, uh, if someone is interested, is blockchain and distributed ledger technologies in business. So it's a business approach to, uh, to blockchain. Uh, there are three components. First, students learn about the technology. Um, there's no coding involved, but they also have hands-on experiences. One of our students will be talking about it a little bit. So, you know, learning how to open a wallet in a safe way, do transactions, create an NFT, but also create a DAO. And second, we learn about the applications, business applications in blockchain. So not only, not only crypto, but also uh, industrial applications, for example, in supply chain. And uh, finally, we, uh, the third module is about uh, implications, so ethical implications, uh, impact of blockchain and some of those choices on work and employment. Well, it's great to uh, create a DAO, but what will be the implications, for example, on the jobs if you combine uh, blockchain, AI, and IoT? It's a very powerful uh, set of technologies. So uh, it's a kind of comprehensive uh, introductory level of, uh, of uh, introduction to blockchain. Uh, we'll, uh, maybe I'll just go back to this uh, previous slide. We're uh, quite uh, fortunate as the first uh, university in Australia, we secured a, a donation from Binance. I'm not sure if it's a good or bad thing today. Uh, <laughs> but we're, we're, we're very proud of it, and, and I hope to, uh, we love the, the relationship with Binance. Uh, it was Binance Charity, actually, to be specific. Um, and there was a donation uh, close to $450,000 um, Australian dollars uh, to help build the uh, Web3 ecosystem in our unit. Uh, the interesting thing is we signed that uh, contract uh, almost a year ago, started the conversations. We still don't have the money. <laughs> it's not because of Binance. It's because someone, I'm not sure if I can, is that recorded? <laughs> All right. I'm, I may tell you the details in the, in the, in the break. But, you know, it's apparently not that easy. It's not that easy to open. Uh, I can switch off the camera. Yes, please do. <laughs> <laughs> switch off the camera. We want to know. It's, it's not so easy to open um, a crypto account in Binance. What do you think about that? Well, you can open one. You just can't deposit any Australian money. <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> well, but it's a, you know, a 15 minute uh, operation uh, takes uh, for some people who uh, have background in finance based on 19th century. Uh, finance and economics, it takes them close to a year. <laughs> so, um, but that's just a kind of, I know it's a relaxing night, I don't want to make it too serious, uh, but this is the reality of, uh, of uh, blockchain or crypto adoption. And because of those kind of frustrations, uh, um, the idea of, uh, we can maybe go to the next slide. Uh, oh yeah, maybe I'll talk also about research. Uh, research is doing a little bit better. Uh, we can do uh, great stuff in terms of research, and uh, we're very proud to have uh, Layer One X being the project who was actually uh, the research was done in uh, the School of Computer Science uh, by Pony Clark. So it's a solid foundation uh, of of good research. Um, disclaimer: I don't hold any tokens, so I'm not. I was not paid for that. I know that uh, I met with Pony, and she. Well. <laughs> Okay, I'm not asking for anything. Um, uh, now, this, 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 I mean, we have to uh, uh, be, be open and transparent with that. Um, but I talked to Pony and she explained me about that research. It was more than a year ago. Uh, and it was really fascinating to see that uh, it is a great project grown here in West Australia. Another great thing to, to be proud of. Um, a very strong ecosystem. Round of applause. It's a, something to be really a proud of. It's a, it's a global project. Yeah. It created here in our, in our backyard. Wonderful. So that's where, what you can do at UWA, uh, but the research is uh, quite diverse. I'm in the School of Management, so we look more at governance. Um, you probably know Dirk Bauer from uh, School of Finance, who's actually uh, uh, leading the center of uh, blockchain uh, research and blockchain and cryptocurrencies, focusing more on crypto, and I think that crypto bros will be happy. Uh, crypto and finance, 
um, computer science, but also law. Uh, some of you perhaps know uh, Alex Cook, who was involved in some of the early projects in 2018. He comes from the School of Law. Uh, so you can cover a great range of research in, in blockchain if you're interested, quite high level. Uh, so I also am involved, we're working on a project with Les de la Force. Some of you know Les, um, an indigenous uh, innovator working with the Minderu Foundation, uh, working on using NFTs for indigenous artists. That's the CryptoMob project. So quite a diversity. So let's move to the next one. Uh, but as I mentioned uh, earlier, out of this frustration that uh, there is a centralized uh, institution, if you work on cent centralized uh, hierarchical, patriarchal, patriarchal, help me with that, yeah, in institutions and organizations, you know how frustrating it is to innovate within those organizations. So what we try to do, uh, create a project that is outside of the university, and uh, it is much more inclusive work with all the universities, the government, and uh, businesses and startups, and tries to uh, show how proud we are uh, in Western Australia to have this growing ecosystem, uh, promote the, the Web3 ecosystem, uh, talk about it, and one of the first events uh, that we uh, had this year in April was the One Web3 conference. Uh, at UWA, uh, thanks uh, to Lay One X for being our, one of our sponsors. It was a very successful event with one of uh, one, 150 uh, attendees, um, usually uh, CEO level of startups uh, from our region, that is mainly Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, uh, Australia, but also a couple of other places. Uh, we also hosted uh, Power Ledger, and Anya was one of the speakers. A quite diverse range of topics. Uh, uh, focusing on Web3 and sustainable use uh, used for sustainable development. So that's one of the uh, projects that uh, grew out of uh, uh, our frustrations with uh, working with the university. And the next one is uh, a project that uh, is very close to my heart. It's the next slide. Oh, well, that's, uh, that's one of the up upcoming events on the Thursday, just in case you sound like interested, uh, including Josh, Josh Han, who is the top lawyer in not only in Western Australia, but in Australia, if not globally. Uh, so if you have any legal worries, go to Josh. Josh will be talking about DAO regulations with uh, a couple of great lawyers in Australia. We also have financial inclusion topic, discussing which is better for financial inclusion, Bitcoin or central bank digital currencies. Very controversial. And we also have Metaverse and NFT, a uh, very hot topic with uh, Manu Chatuson here, uh, an executive from uh, um, Western Australia Marketing Association. So very exciting topic, uh, a set of panels coming on Thursday. But one more thing uh, that is very close to my heart. We started this kind of simple organization, a kind of interest group at UWA in 2018, uh, Blockchain Technologies Knowledge Network. Blockchain uh, means uh, Bitcoin Technologies Knowledge Network, uh, which was supposed to be critical of blockchain because uh, that was the time when everybody was a blockchain. Uh, when everybody is blockchain, some things are not blockchains. Don't you think so? When everything is decentralized, some things cannot be decentralized. So uh, that's where we started looking critically at some of the projects um, and at that space and, and uh, developed a kind of hardcore group of, um, you know, hard, hard, no, I don't want to call them Bitcoin hardcore uh, <laughs> funds, but people who, uh, who are uh, uh, more idealists and uh, stay true to some of these uh, very basic principles of decentralization and don't want to compromise them for money. So that's a not-for-profit. Uh, and out of that grew uh, an association that we formed with students and at the next slide, uh, where we formed a DAO this year. So working through the unit with the students, we learned how to build a simple DAO using third-party <coughs> solutions. And we have, wow, our DAO, it's completely uh, illegal. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> Just for everyone, not many people know what, what DAO Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Um, I'm sorry, I kind of had a feeling I'm preaching to convert it already. Uh, so decentralized autonomous organization. It's a structure that you can build on uh, blockchain. It was a project created, or the idea was ODAO was created by Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum in 2014, um, uh, proposing that you can uh, run an organization. And I like his quote, I cannot quote it uh, uh, to the letter. Uh, usually um, when there was innovation, in, uh, technological innovation in organizations, um, management tried to outsource the manual work or the kind of uh, repetitive work, either through automation or to outsource it overseas. What DAO does, it outsources management. That's beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, what it does in the end, it automates uh, many administrative and, and um, managerial processes, connecting those who actually create value, the workers, uh, with the uh, consumers or, or the users of the product or services. So it's just an automated organization that puts, uh, it's kind of peer-to-peer -peer economy in the purest sense. Um, our version of that was very simple. 
uh, it's more about voting um, in a decentralized way without having any kind of central authority. Uh, just an experimental project, but I will have my student, uh, uh, Fabian, uh, tell a little bit about his experience in the uni, because obviously I could be biased. So do not believe me, do not trust me, always verify. I didn't pay him either. So Fabian, a uh, couple minutes for you, thank you. Um, hello everyone. Um, thanks again, Andrea, for inviting me. Um, what can I say, like my about my journey for twelve weeks? So, I just put like a few things, like to summarize, like in four steps, like what it was going through, all the experience. Uh, of course, in the beginning, like we are part of the business school, so many of us are. They don't have really like programming background or so, what about blockchain? For many of us, it was like, okay, it's about monkeys. Um, Bitcoin, they are super expensive, so you have one, you have a lot of money, so good for you. And that's it. So we went like, all the information, like, we read the uh, Satoshi Nakamoto document, all of that, like, it was so much information. Like, my brain was about to explode. It was, what is this? Okay, I need to understand. I, I went through, uh, we went through, and we had some time meetings together to like, what do you understand of this for? What do you understand of the one from the 12 books Andrew just sent us? That, mm, yeah, maybe this is so. We create, it was funny because we start to learn together all the time. Like, we create a chat group, we start like, hey, someone knows what is this about? So. Some of the engineers start to explain and everything. So after that, we went to the next steps. Like we start an individual project and the group project. So we start like, yes, blockchain is cool. Blockchain for everyone. You have a blockchain. This company needs a blockchain. So and then what we were learning all together, we start to see like the limitations and the feasibility of the projects. Like we started. Like, Mm, yes, maybe for this kind of situation it's not necessary, no everyone needs. Mm, my best example, sometimes it was like, we were learning about quantum computing, so it said like, probably I don't need a quantum computer to be on YouTube, watch some videos, so blockchain it was part of that. So we start to like slowly go through and like, say like, you know what, yes, this sounds good and some of the projects were amazing. Uh, really focused on what blockchains can really like do for companies and communities. So um, that was the part. Um, in this was in the middle, we were doing the DAO project. So everyone put a little bit of themselves in create this NFT and we create the DAO community and we start to come in and everyone was really encouraged. Like this is some of the the, the old projects, my old photographies, many like really personal things. All these NFT they have something. Even one of our like classmates, like I don't want to say like come out with part of the unicorn community. That that's they say, and it was amazing. So like, yeah, the, and this is my NFT, and this is represent me, and everything. We like, cool. That was amazing, and in the end, we finished with like in the last weeks, like the real potential for communities are from Colombia. Uh, many of the classmates are from other part of the world, and we could see like the possibility for a small communities like. Some places the government doesn't exist, but at least everyone has a fund. And through the fund, through like all projects, personal projects, we say like maybe we can make a different. <coughs> now it's just theoric, now it's just on the papers, but we did our best. We did like really financial analysis, uh, customer service analysis, everything to make it sure like it's possible. Like if we want to go to the next step, it is possible. Right? It's a real idea. So, yeah, it was that all what was about this semester, and yeah, we have fun and make many friends. Um, yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs>
anyway, this is this is really very personal story. Uh, not often do you see uh, uh, here students in business who are very rational talking about emotion. Oscar, and thank you to Fabian as well for getting out and speaking. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Martin Purcell. Uh, Martin is the managing director of One Brand, uh, who helps create new brands and revitalizes existing brands. And today, Martin will be talking about uh, building a better brand. So, round of applause, please, for Martin Purcell. Uh, good evening all. Uh, first up, I'd just like to actually thank Leo and X, uh, Matu and Kevin and all your colleagues uh, for putting on the event. It takes a lot of work, uh, particularly Johnny uh, and all associated with tonight. Um, thanks for organising this great turnout as well. So, yeah, thanks. So I'm kind of a little bit like the odd guy out tonight, and it's not because I'm wearing my salmon pink jacket, it's because um, my message is, is really universal, not just to businesses in the blockchain or the Web3 space, and although it's blockchain week, um, what I'm about to talk to you about can apply to any business. So just as a start, I'd like to get a kind of sense of who's in the room. Um, for those people that have either run your own business before or have your own startup, or done your own thing, self-employed, put your hand up. Okay, quite a lot. I'd say that's probably at least half or more put their hands up. And those that may not have put their hand up, maybe working for someone else, um, that have aspirations to run your own enterprise, hands up. So a few more. I think we've covered most of the room. So what I'm about to show you can, can apply to any enterprise that you're working with. Um, and the reason I get asked to speak at these events, particularly in Web3 and blockchain, is that in the past few years, we've done a lot of work with startups in the space, in the tech space. And we often find the same issues crop up in terms of how they market themselves, how they brand themselves, how they get the message out there. So in our sort of um, learnings, we've come across, one of the big ones is lost in tech. So you've got a great idea and uh, there's a lot of technical applications around it. There's a lot of codes, a lot of algorithms, might be AI uh, that we're coming into now. Whatever it might be, we often get so embroiled in all the machinations of it that we forget to actually communicate the benefits or the outcomes. And I've seen so many presentations where it's just so mind-boggling to the audience that there's no takeaways because the mind is just so jumbled with information. So if you're ever doing a startup or you've got one now, be really mindful not to get lost in the tech. Right? Another one is fuzzy logic, right? Where you often see a lot of contradiction about what someone says somewhere at the beginning of their information or their investment kind of portfolio or their prospectus or their business overview or plan. And as you read through it, you see a lot of ambiguity. It's just not logical. So there's lots of ideas, but there's not a common thread. And so there's not a coherence to the document. And you don't feel like you're talking or looking at one enterprise. You feel like there's several. Okay? Another one is the first slide you saw up there, which was moving goalposts. Now, this is, this is what happens when you have a startup, because you start with an idea, and it does go through several iterations and evolutions. So that what you think you start with, the idea that you first had, does change, so it does evolve. But when you're trying to get money, or when you're trying to get people interested, or when you're trying to really kind of get established in the marketplace, you need to have fixed upon your North Star and decided what you stand for and what you're offering. And if you keep moving the goalposts, people don't know what you are, and they won't invest, and they won't get on board. So some of the key learnings as we've sort of looked at over the last few years as tech companies have tried to sort of put their information together, they're the key learnings. Ambiguity in terms of the opportunity, too verbose, getting lost in the tech, all the things you see there. So some of the key takeaways of things you'll want to avoid if you're trying to get your startup happening. All right? These are the things you don't want. 
Memorable brands are not created by chance. Okay? All the best brands you see out there, they are consciously engineered and they continue to be curated. You think of Nike where it started and where it is now. They might have had some of the core fundamentals in place, but they continue to curate and curate and refine. Okay? But they don't happen by chance. There's a reason you remember when you walk into that supermarket or, you, or wherever you might be, you remember some brands and not others. So, what makes up a great brand? Let's look at a few elements. Typically, when you talk to people about a brand, they might say, oh, you know, get a, get a logo, I need a website, and go straight for getting assets. Because what do you want to do when you've got a great idea and you want to get cracking? First of all, you've pro probably got fairly short pockets, and you want to get your idea to, the, to market as soon as possible. So the first thing is get a logo and, and let's, let's go find a web developer. But the web developer's not a brand guy or a, he's not thinking about your business model. He's waiting for you to give him the content, he or she. And suddenly, you know, it's, uh, get something online and that's my business, right? That's my business collateral. So no, these are all the things that go to make up your brand. And it all looks expensive, a big shopping list, right? And because, as I mentioned, people have got short pockets. But there's ways you can do it. And it doesn't cost arms and legs, but you can still do it mindfully and intentionally so that you actually have all your assets working together nicely. So those are all the things that go to make up a brand, not just a logo or an emblem. How do we do it? Typically what happens is people go straight for design. That's about stage four, right? I need something, I go to a graphic designer and we start creating something. But it's about a great story. You think, you think when you leave tonight, what's probably one of the presentations you're going to remember most of all? I suggest it's probably going to be Brandon's. Three slides and a great story about a woman crying. <laughs> okay? No, but it's the whole idea around the story. We don't remember lists of facts. We remember stories. We are biologically wired to remember stories. In times past, we didn't have parchment and ink to write. So we passed it on through storytelling around campfires with message sticks and so forth. And we remember stories with a different part of our brain. If I tell you five things now and you walk out of the room, you probably remember three of them. But if I weave those five elements or bits of information to a story, you will remember them all because you remember it in a different way. So you remember the story that Brand has told tonight. So that's really what building a great brand is. It's about creating a really compelling story. So before you go racing for your graphic designer, take the time to do the research. Look at your competitors. Take the time to actually look at your brand assets. What are the opportunities? What are the challenges? What are your brand values? What sort of persona do you want to create? We often talk about the three, C, three Ps. Positioning. Who are we? What are we? Where are we in the marketplace? Who are our competitors? What do we want to be like? What are we offering? Promise. What are we actually delivering? What do we say we're going to give? And persona. What sort of vibe, tone, energy, voice? do we want to have? What colours? What do we want to feel like? What entity are we building? So those three Ps. So you do that before you go into design. So you take the time to discover, do your brand workshops, understand, get real commonality around your vision and your values and the narrative and the personality. And then that, that will inform what sort of design you need to have. And then the designs will be in alignment with how you see your business. It won't be the wrong design. It won't be something something's just done for you, thrown at you. It's something that you've engineered organically and authentically from within. And you'll have something that is meaningful to you and that you can really build your culture around. Then you can apply it to all sorts of things, right? So what typically happens is people start to think about the application process. And you might only have a budget to do a bit of social media. That's fine. You don't have the big budget to run events or do PR or, you know, run campaigns. But whatever you're doing, make sure that it's consistent and that you've created and crafted a story that fits your business model. 
These are some brands we've built over the years. Some of these you would know, you would see, you would drive past them every day. Whether it's Speed Fit doing exercise, or Stephen Murphy Electrical, or Rhythm Psychology, a psychiatrist, um, psychologist I should say, Northside Rentals. These are the brands you live and breathe and see every day as you go about. One thing you'll notice with all these, they're all very simple, very clear, very clean. They're not over-engineered. And that's what you want to achieve. A really clean brand that is unique to you and your business or your enterprise. And here's a few examples. It could be a shop fitter. Nice, clean, clear brand. You could be earth machinery company. Or a cosmetic surgeon. Uh, company we work with in Sydney. They're now probably the most preeminent uh, surgeons, cosmetic surgeons in the country. They've opened about five centres on tour. Um, might be a dry cleaner, might be a construction firm, might be an IT company or a security firm uh, and working in aged care. A consultant firm in the mining sector, in property, in blockchain. Some of the ones we've worked with recently in blockchain, Scooptix and so forth. So just a quick run through, just a few visuals, just to give you a sense of they're all very different businesses. But the methodology and the process to get that result is the same. It's those five Ds. Before you just run out the door and design something, discovery, definition, design, then you can deploy it out. And the fifth one is debrief after you've, after you've done all that. So quick grab, quick little bit of education. Um, take the time to craft a great brand story if you read a good book, you know that it's been written by one author. There's a certain tenor, there's a certain way of writing. Like if you're turning page one of Harry Potter and you get to page 500 and something, you know that that one author has written it right the way through because it's got a certain feel, a certain tone. And that doesn't matter whether it's a modern author or a Shakespeare or, or whoever. Right? Um, your brand's the same. You want to create a feel. And you don't want to keep changing it. So I've talked about three P's, talked about five D's, and I'll leave you with three C's. <laughs> Make sure your brand has clarity, your messaging. So back to that first slide, back to those learnings. Don't keep changing the message. Make sure it makes sense from A to Z. Make sure you've got something that's compelling. Don't just have lists of dot points of information. Create something, a memorable story, right? Great metaphors. I often say, and Johnny's probably heard me say this a number of times in brand workshops, um, you know, inspire me, shock me, delight me, humour me, but for fuck's sake, don't bore me, <laughs> all right? So can, give me something compelling. Give me something I will remember. And the third one is consistency, okay? Whatever you do create, make sure that you keep using it. You don't keep changing. There's a great marketing adage which goes, um, repetition builds reputation, okay? So if you keep changing the message, you don't build that brand equity. You don't retain uh, who you are in people's minds. So there's your five Ds, your three Ps, and your three Cs to build a great brand. Thank you.